All right, so uh, today uh, we are going to continue talking about the effects of neighborhoods on upward mobility. And I'm going to go back first to the Opportunity Atlas, which is what we were talking about, as you'll remember, at the end of the last lecture. Uh, just to refresh your memory, we started out with this national map, which shows you rates of upward mobility across America. So red colors are areas with lower levels of upward mobility. Blue colors are areas with higher levels of upward mobility. And the statistic we're focusing on specifically is what is the average income in adulthood of kids who grow up in low-income families, families at the 25th percentile of the parental income distribution. So I gave you an example at the end of the last lecture in Los Angeles, where you saw a really sharp variation in kids' outcomes between Watts and Compton. I'm now going to give you a different example, a more local one that illustrates some simple themes. So let's uh, go here to Boston and zoom in. Um, and so if we look at Boston, uh, just zoom out a little bit to get a little more perspective. So you see, you know, Cambridge, where we are, generally looks pretty good in terms of rates of upward mobility. You actually see some pretty sharp variation even within Cambridge. So if you look at, if you guys recognize, like, this is like the Central Square area for kids growing up in the 80s and 90s, the Central Square area, you actually see significantly worse outcomes than in West Cambridge and East Cambridge. Why is that interesting? It, it, all of those kids go to the same school, generally. You go to the Cambridge public schools. So this level of variation shows you that this is not just about schools. We're going to start talking in this lecture about what is driving this, but that's a first clue that this is not entirely about schools. Um, so what I want to focus on here is if you go to uh, South Boston, you go to areas like Roxbury, for example, you see colors that look like what we see in some of the lowest upward mobility places in the US. So even in a city like Boston, which most people think of as you know, pretty good institutions, good labor market, things like that, you see pretty poor outcomes in certain parts of the city. Uh, in particular, you know, some of these high poverty areas uh, south, of, uh, south of downtown. But interestingly, if you go over here to this area, which is called Savin Hill, um, you, you see significantly better outcomes. So this is a different part of Dorchester. So this, again, if you were just kind of driving around in Boston, you would recognize that the more affluent parts of Boston are places like Brookline, the western suburbs, uh, West Cambridge, and so forth. And Roxbury, Dorchester are less affluent. But when you're driving around, and especially in the 90s and 2000s, I don't think you would have thought that this area, Savin Hill, was necessarily dramatically different. But you see that kids' outcomes for the low-income kids who grow up there look quite different, right? So that's the type of variation that I think can, is both interesting in its own right to understand what's going on with the American dream, but it also, from a scientific point of view, gives us a great way to learn about basically you know, what's driving the difference between the blue and the red areas and what might you be able to do in the red areas to improve outcomes for kids in America more broadly. Okay, so with that backdrop, I'm gonna now go back uh, to the slides, um, and do we have a clicker, Greg? Uh, and uh, we're gonna talk through uh, why we're seeing these differences um, across places, okay? So there are two, uh, thanks, two very different explanations uh, for the variation in children's outcomes across areas that uh, I just showed you. The first is what economists would call sorting. So basically the idea that different people live in different places. So the people who live in South Boston are different from the people who live in Cambridge. The people who live in Atlanta are obviously different from the types of people who live in Salt Lake City. Different in numerous ways, right? Different potentially in terms of racial and ethnic background, different in terms of education, you know, what their interests are. There are all kinds of differences. And so while we see these differences uh, in this geographic sense, it could just be that, you know, it's not fundamentally about geography or about neighborhoods, it's just about the sorting of people across places. So if that were what is going on, then the types of policies that you'd want to think about to address this issue would not necessarily be place-focused, they would be people-focused. Because if we were to find that, you know, there's certain subgroups in America, which we will talk about, you know, for instance, uh, black kids, have much poorer prospects of upward mobility than white kids in the United States. That's just a clear fact in the data, no matter where 
kids are growing up, uh, that is a, a problem that you have to address directly at the level of the person, thinking about issues like discrimination and so forth, rather than a problem that you'd, arise, that you'd necessarily address at the level of the neighborhood. So now a very different explanation is that, about, is that these differences across places reflect causal effects. That is to say, if I were to take a given child and put that child in the red colored part of the map versus the blue colored part of the map, I'd see different outcomes for that given child. Under that causal effect explanation, I might actually want to have policies that target the red colored places on the map and figure out what you can change in those places to improve outcomes there. Okay, so you can see that at like a conceptual level, sort of a fork in the road. Which of these two explanations is at play is going to determine what types of things you then want to think about in more detail. And so this is a question that social scientists, you know, there are many famous people at Harvard like William Julius Wilson and other scholars who for the past 30 years have been grappling with these issues of we see these stark differences across neighborhoods in various ways. Is that about sorting? Is that about causal effects? What exactly is going on here? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do in this lecture is talk about a series of studies and some empirical evidence that sheds light on this issue of sorting versus causal effects. Now, anytime you're asking a question like this, when you uh, get to causal inference, you, you want to understand causation, it's always useful to step back and ask, if you think back to like your middle school or high school science classes, what is the ideal experiment that you would run if you could, okay? And so ideally what you would do if you wanted to answer this question is randomly assign kids to all of the different neighborhoods in America and compare their outcomes in adulthood, right? Intuitively, by doing that, I wipe out all the differences in the types of people living in different places. And if I see that when I randomly assign kids to grow up in Dorchester as opposed to Savin Hill, as opposed to Cambridge, I see differences in outcomes, I can be confident that it's due to the causal effect of those places as opposed to differences in the types of people living in those places. Now, obviously, running an experiment like that on a national scale is going to be impossible. Uh, and so the key challenge in this context and in social science more broadly is how do we learn about causation in a setting where it is very difficult to run experiments? So what we're going to do is approximate that sort of ideal experiment with what I call a quasi-experimental design, which is basically, think of it as coming as close to an experiment as we can with the data that we have on hand, okay? And so what I'm gonna do here is describe this quasi-experimental approach that we take in work with my colleague here at Harvard, Nathan Hendren, uh, John Friedman at Brown, and our collaborators at the Census Bureau. Uh, where we study three million families who move across census tracts in observational data. So what does observational data mean? It means data where there's no experiment. It's just like the data as you get it, whatever's happening in the real world, it's what we observe. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is look at, there are lots of families who move with their kids across neighborhoods, right? And I suspect many of you during your own childhood moved across uh, different census tracts. And so the key idea here is going to be to exploit variation in the age of the child when a family moves from, say, a red-colored part of the map to a more blue-colored part of the map in order to isolate the causal effect of environment. So what I'm going to do here is give you first a relatively non-technical high-level summary with an example of how this approach works. And then I will go into more detail on the assumptions underlying the approach. And then later on, we'll talk in further detail about the statistical methodology uh, here in greater detail and so on. Okay? So let's start with the example. It's, it's really quite a simple idea. So imagine that we've got a set of families that move from Roxbury, where if you grow up from birth, as we saw in the map, it was in a relatively red color. Low-income kids who grew up there from birth have average incomes in adulthood of $23,000 a year, okay? So it's not great. As we saw in the example that I just started with, if instead you were to grow up in Savin Hill from birth, you do much better on average, okay? So what I want you to do is now think about a set of families that move from Roxbury to Savin Hill with kids of different ages, okay? Starting with families who move when their child is exactly two years old, 
So what we do in the tax records that I was talking about the last lecture is take uh, all of these families who made this move in this particular example, uh, and we track those kids forward 30 years using the tax data to measure their own earnings when they're adults. And we see, as shown by this first dot here, that the average child who moves from Roxbury to Savin Hill at age two is earning $38,000 a year, okay? So that's for the kids who move when they're exactly two. Now we're gonna repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from Roxbury to Savin Hill, the less of a gain you get. And if you move by the time you're in your early 20s or after that point, the relationship is completely flat and you get no gain at all, okay? So what do you see uh, from this analysis? Under what we call an identification assumption that makes this as good as an experiment, which I'll come back to in a second, um, there are really three key lessons, I think, that, that you can see from this chart. The first is that you know, what this suggests is where you grow up really matters, right? It's not just that the people who live in Roxbury are different from the people who live in Savin Hill. Apparently, if a given kid moves from Roxbury to Savin Hill, especially at a younger age, they see really significant changes in their life outcomes. Second, what you see is that what really seems to matter is childhood environment as opposed to where you live as an adult. We've seen in this context and various other contexts, which I'll describe later, that moving as an adult really has very little impact on your economic outcomes. Third, you see that every extra year of exposure to a better childhood environment improves kids' long-term outcomes. So it's not just, you know, some of you might be aware there's a lot of focus on early childhood education nowadays, so interventions, say, before kids are three or four years old. And so while we think that can be extremely valuable, what this chart shows you is that even if you move to a better neighborhood when you're 10 instead of 15, or you know, five instead of 10, you still see quite substantial gains, right? So environment continues to matter throughout childhood, not just in the very earliest years. Now, so you know, those are, I think, the high-level conclusions that you can draw from this type of analysis. And let me now step into, go one layer deeper and talk a little bit more in detail about what we're doing here and what assumptions we're making to draw those three conclusions. Okay, so I described this to you in the context of a single example, moving from Roxbury to Savin Hill. But as you probably guess intuitively, if you think about the number of families who are making that exact move, it's not gonna be very large, right? And so you're not gonna have enough data to actually trace out this curve with this much precision just off of the families who make literally that move. So what we're actually doing here is using the data on three million families who move across all these different neighborhoods in America. And we're basically asking when you move to a place where we see average incomes of kids who grew up there from birth or say $10,000 higher, how much of that gain do you pick up based on the age at which you move there? So more precisely, we're running a separate regression for kids who move at each of these different ages regressing their own incomes in adulthood on the incomes of, on the average incomes of the kids we see in the destination versus the origin. Okay, we'll talk in a little bit more detail on that. You can look in the paper or we'll discuss that in the sections. Um, and so we do that analysis separately for each age and that's what gives you the points that you're seeing on this chart. And then you can translate that back to any specific example you'd like, like this Roxbury versus Savin Hill as a way to understand more concretely uh, what you're really seeing, okay? Now, in order to, to make the claim that this reflects the causal effect of moving to a better neighborhood at an earlier age, you need to make a critical assumption. What any quasi-experimental design relies on some assumption, what is called in econometrics an identification assumption. And in this case, the key assumption that makes this as good as an experiment is that the timing of your move to a better or worse area is unrelated to other determinants of kids' outcomes. So coming back to this chart here, we need it to be the case that families who moved from Roxbury to Savin Hill when their kid was two years old are comparable to families who moved when their kid was five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, and so forth, okay? 
Under that assumption, we can compare the dots on this chart and treat that as being as good as a randomized experiment. We can interpret that as a pure causal effect of moving at different ages. Now, anytime you make an assumption like that, it's useful to think about, you know, what are the cases where that assumption holds and what are the cases where it might not hold, okay? And so in particular, there are two things that you might worry about. The most obvious thing that a lot of people think of is that maybe the families who move when their children are young are just different from the families who move when their children are older. Maybe they're more motivated to be focused on helping their kids do better. Maybe they're more educated. Maybe they're more wealthy. You know, who knows what's different about the families who move when their children are, are relatively young versus the families who move when their children are older. So if, if that were the case, suppose, for instance, the families who decided to make this move when their children were young tended to be more educated or more motivated parents, then you might see that those children end up doing better, but it's not because of the causal effect of growing up in Savin Hill in that example. It's just because you have a different family background than the people who moved uh, when, when they were older, than the children who moved when they were older. So how do you deal with that sort of problem? So one of the advantages of having so much data, these huge data sets, uh, is that you can use, I think, really precise approaches to isolate those kinds of problems. So in particular, uh, what we do to address this first bias here um, is to compare siblings' outcomes within the same family in order to control for family effects, okay? So to explain what I mean by that, come back to this chart here. Imagine now that I have a family that moves with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old from Roxbury to Savin Hill. What we do is replicate this chart, only making comparisons across siblings within the same family. And a remarkable finding, which is in this paper, is that you get exactly the same chart back if you compare across siblings within a family. That is to say, the three-year-old is doing better than the seven-year-old exactly in proportion to the gap that you're seeing on this chart here. So what that demonstrates is it cannot be that the families who are moving when their kids are young are different from the families who are moving when their kids are old. That can't be what's driving this because you continue to see exactly the same pattern when you compare uh, two brothers or a brother and sister you know, growing up within the same family. Is that clear? Any, any questions on that? Yeah, so the question was, you know, do you see the same thing if you look at the opposite move, Savin Hill to Roxbury rather than Roxbury to Savin Hill? And the answer is yes, it's the exact mirror image. So moving to a better place, you know, one for one improves your outcomes if you move earlier. Moving to a worse place, a redder colored place on the map, one for one you see a deterioration of outcomes proportional to age. Yeah, so it's totally consistent with like an exposure, like a dosage model is what you'd call it uh, in the medical literature. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, excellent question. So th you're getting it, I think, basically now the second by type of bias that you might worry about. So the first bias that I was describing is something that is fixed within families, and we can take that out by comparing siblings. You're exactly right that biases that vary between siblings that are related to where you're moving can potentially create a problem, right? So just to be clear on that, if it's just that you learn how to parent better, and so your second kid does better than your first kid, that actually is not going to create a problem for our analysis because you'd need that effect to be correlated with where you are moving in order to generate this chart, right? If it's just that second kids do better than first kids, that's kind of going to get washed out when I, come, when I look specifically at people who move from Roxbury to Savin Hill. It's got to be that when I move from Roxbury to Savin Hill, something happens that benefits the second kid differentially relative to the first kid. And so what's an example of that? It could be something like you got a better job or there was a change in family status. So people don't just move at random, they move for a reason. And so a very natural reason that you might move to a better neighborhood is you got a better job and now your family has more money. Well, if your family has more money, it could well be that the younger kid 
starts to do better than the older kid because they're spending more time growing up in a family with more resources than the, young, than the older kid, right? So that would be an example of something where you see a difference between the two siblings and the opportunities they have in a way that's correlated with where you're moving, and that would again screw up this, this analysis, right? That would again create bias. So how do we deal with that problem? So uh, you can again exploit the data, to the, the dimensionality of the data, to assess whether that seems like a plausible explanation. So coming now here to point two, in particular, what we do in this paper is use differences in neighborhood effects across subgroups to implement what we call placebo tests. So the placebo test terminology might be familiar uh, to you from like the medical drug literature, where as you, as you know, often you will have a placebo group where they get a placebo pill instead of the real pill and you compare the placebo to the actual. So we can do something analogous here with this data so uh, in the data, if you look at the Opportunity Atlas, which by the way, you will do for your first problem set or empirical project, we'll have you look at the Opportunity Atlas and uh, work with it, develop a story for the neighborhood where you grew up and, uh, grew up and so forth. Um, so if you look at that in more detail, you will see, uh, as I kind of hinted at with the LA example, where you saw particularly negative outcomes for black men, but it turns out black women growing up in Watts actually don't do as poorly. So there's a lot of variation across neighborhoods, across subgroups, so across gender, across racial groups, and so forth. Um, and you can use that to implement basically what, what is like a placebo test, okay? So in particular, we see that some places have better outcomes for boys than girls. So now imagine you have a family that has a son and a daughter uh, and look at what happens to those kids' outcomes when they move to a place uh, where we see that boys have particularly good outcomes, okay? What we see in that case is that their son's outcomes improve in proportion to the number of years they're growing up there, like in the graph that I showed you, but their daughter's outcomes don't change at all, okay? So again, you see this very sharp uh, picture uh, where if you take a family with um, you know, two kids of different genders, you're seeing a convergence in the outcomes uh, to the gender-specific patterns that you see in that neighborhood. Why is that interesting? Why does the rule out, that rule out the type of bias we were talking about? You know, if you think the problem is that families got wealthier, got a better job when they moved to a different place, it would be kind of odd if that happened to only improve their son's outcome and not their daughter's outcome depending upon where exactly they ended up, right? So we implement a set of tests that look like this, that have that flavor, which show that kids' outcomes converge to the full distribution of outcomes that you see in the destination to which they're moving in a very precise way. So to give you another example, there are some places where you see particularly high teenage pregnancy rates. If you move at a younger age as a girl to, to an area with very high teenage pregnancy rates, you are significantly more likely to have a teenage birth uh, yourself. And that's true you know, regardless of whether or not that place produces particularly high earnings or certain outcomes for boys and so forth. So on this full kind of spectrum or vector of different outcomes, you see this very precise convergence when people move to different areas in proportion to the amount of time they spend growing up there. And when you think about it, it, it really seems implausible that other factors that vary across siblings could produce exactly that sort of, sort of convergence on all of those dimensions. And so we make that more precise in the paper, writing down the statistics to make that argument rigorous. Um, but you can see intuitively how, even though I'm not able to run that ideal randomized experiment in this case, I'm able to make a pretty credible case that something like two thirds of the variation in the upward mobility that we're seeing in the maps that I started out with is due to causal effects, leaving one third to be explained by sorting. Okay, so to, to be clear, I'm not saying that all of the variation across these places is due to causal effects. And in fact, in later lectures, we're going to talk about in particular the very important role of race and how race matters above and beyond neighborhood. So that's an, exp uh, that's an example of a sorting effect. It has nothing to do with the causal effect of neighborhoods. Um, but two thirds of it, a big chunk of it, is actually due to something that's going on in the environment, in the childhood environment in particular, of these different areas, okay? And so that suggests that taking a place-focused approach to improving economic opportunity, 
kind of breaking down America into all of these different neighborhoods and fixing the neighborhoods that don't look so great could actually be a pretty productive path forward. Okay, so that's conclusion number one in figuring out what we do about this problem. Questions about that before I move on to the next segment? Okay, so the next question that you might have in your mind is, okay, we've shown that growing up in some parts of America is better for economic opportunity than others. So what is it that's driving these differences in mobility across places? Okay, why do some places produce much better outcomes for disadvantaged kids than others? So the first thing we're gonna do here is just a simple correlational analysis. We're gonna begin by characterizing the properties of areas with high rates of upward mobility, essentially asking, do places with higher mobility, the blue colored places on the map, do they tend to have better jobs, better schools, different types of institutions? Like what, what sorts of clues can we look for in terms of what might be driving this? So often when I present this work publicly, the first thing many people think of is that it's about the types of jobs in an area or economic growth, job growth, things like that. It's all about, you know, are there good jobs here or not? And so it turns out, I think one of the surprising conclusions from uh, this work is that that actually is not very important. And so I'm gonna illustrate that with this scatter plot here. So what we're doing here is taking the 30 largest metro areas in America, and on the uh, y-axis, we're plotting just our standard upward mobility measure from the map, okay? The average income of kids who grew up in that area in low-income families. And on the horizontal axis, we're taking a very standard measure of economic growth or the strength of the local economy, which is job growth rates from 1990 to 2010. So before we started doing this work on upward mobility, uh, when people thought about the, the health of cities, often people would focus on, on measures like this, okay? And so what you can see when you just, first of all, just look at the scatter plot is you see that it looks kind of like a cloud, right? There's not much of a relationship between these two things. There's not much of a correlation between upward mobility and rates of job growth. In particular, you have places like Charlotte and Atlanta, which are places that have had exceptionally high job growth in the past 20, 25 years. Some of you, you know, might be from those areas. Charlotte and Atlanta are often viewed as like the booming success economies of the South. Yet, remarkably, Charlotte and Atlanta are also the places in America with the very lowest levels of upward mobility for the kids who grow up there. So how can you have both of those things? You both have very low upward mobility for the kids growing up in your area, and you have a lot of job growth. How does that happen? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so uh, one potential explanation for lack of correlation here is that you know, maybe these are actually not high paying jobs. So this is all jobs. You can do this for jobs that are relatively high paying, you get a very similar picture. So that is not actually, you know, that is a potential hypothesis. It turns out that's not what's driving this relationship. Charlotte in particular, you might know intuitively a lot of finance jobs, a lot of very high paying jobs. If you were to drive around downtown Charlotte, you would think like, wow, this place really looks like it's booming. Uh, it's not just low paying jobs that are expanding there, okay? And so, so the question is then, how does it add up, right? How come the kids there are not you know, getting these jobs and doing well? Well, fundamentally it turns out, Charlotte is basically importing talent from other parts of America, right? That's how this works. So Charlotte, there are tons of people who move to Charlotte and get those high paying jobs, same thing in Atlanta, but somehow for the kids who grow up in those cities, they don't end up benefiting a great deal, okay? And so what that shows you is that job growth, well, obviously at some level, you need jobs somewhere in the economy for people to move up in the income distribution. The local strength of the economy actually is not that strong of a predictor of differences in upward mobility across places. Um, that is to say, childhood development and what we call human capital in economics uh, is a fundamentally distinct thing from trying to get better jobs in an area. So why is this such an important point just in and of itself? You know, think about like the recent focus on getting the Amazon headquarters to various cities, right? Generate a lot of attention in the news. Cities did all kinds of things, give big tax incentives and stuff to bring Amazon to, to Queens, for example. So what this says is, you know, that could be good. And you know, a bunch of people are, are gonna get jobs from that. Not at all obvious that your local residents are gonna benefit. Uh, from that, right? You need to think in a more concerted way about how you actually take advantage of that to help the people growing up there get those jobs. Otherwise, you're just gonna attract a bunch of other people 
uh, to move into the city uh, and get those high paying jobs. Okay, so that's point number one. It's kind of a negative result that it's not fundamentally about indicators of the labor market strength. Looking at job growth here, you can look at a bunch of different ones, wage growth, types of jobs, types of industry, none of that really seems predictive. So what is actually going on? What I'm, we've looked at, as you can imagine, a many, many different factors that might predict this variation across areas. And I'm gonna summarize here the five strongest correlates of upward mobility uh, that we have found. So the first turns out to be segregation. Places that are more segregated by race or by income tend to have significantly lower levels of upward mobility. Now, there are many different ways in which you can measure segregation, so the extent to which low and high income people or black and white people are living in proximity to, to each other. So there are many different statistical measures you can use. It turns out, though, that the patterns here are so stark that it doesn't matter what statistic you use, you can just see them, see the results visually. So let me give you a couple examples. So this map here depicts racial segregation in the city of Atlanta, in the Atlanta metro area. So the way it's constructed is we take everybody in the census, constructed by a demographer named Dustin Cable, uh, takes census data, think of it as every person in Atlanta in the census is represented by a dot, and the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. So you can see immediately, it doesn't matter what statistical measure you use, it's totally obvious that Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city, right? Uh, black, uh, the black population in Atlanta lives on the south side completely separated from the white population. You see similar uh, smaller pockets for Hispanics uh, and Asians, okay? So Atlanta and cities that look like this in terms of their residential structure have, tend to have the lowest rates of upward mobility in the United States. And importantly, very low rates of upward mobility, not just for the black Americans growing up there, but also for the low-income white Americans growing up there, as we will see in later lectures. So this is not just a racial story. In very segregated places, all low-income people essentially have poor chances of climbing the income ladder. Now, by contrast, if you take Sacramento, which actually has the same minority share as Atlanta, the same fraction of blacks and Hispanics as Atlanta, Sacramento is a very different city in terms of residential structure. You can see the colors are much more interspersed here, right? They're not perfectly interspersed, but they're definitely much more interspersed than Atlanta. And corresponding to that, Sacramento and cities that look like this tend to have much higher rates of upward mobility. Okay, so that's pattern number one uh, in the data, strong association between segregation and rates of upward mobility. Now, what is the mechanism driving that? There are many potential mechanisms that you might think about. If you live in a city that looks like this, low-income kids and minority kids are gonna tend to go to very different schools because kids tend to go to local public schools in most US cities. They're gonna go to very different schools than kids from more affluent backgrounds, right? And if you think about how schools are financed in the United States from your local property tax base, it means that you're basically gonna go to a school with less resources if you are growing up in a city like this relative to a city like this. So one explanation is that segregation matters because it creates differences in, in resources. A different explanation is that it's something about spillovers and mentoring and knowledge. Like if you're around other people who are doing better, have different experiences and so forth, that influences your outlook in life, your aspirations, changes your network, maybe that changes what you're able to do. So we don't know yet what's driving this correlation. Um, it could be one of those two mechanisms, it could be something else. What we do know at this point is there's some very tight link between segregation and, and rates of upward mobility. And so that's something that we and others are spending more time uh, studying in further detail. Okay, so now a bit more quickly, let's go through the other five factors. So second, we find a link between levels of income inequality within a city and rates of upward mobility across generations. So in particular, Places with a smaller middle class, fewer people between the 25th and 75th percentile of the national income distribution, tend to have much less mobility across generations. So what that's saying is basically, as many of you might know, there's growing inequality in the US, and to the extent that there's a causal link between inequality and rates of upward mobility across generations, as we have more inequality within a generation, 
it might also get harder for kids to climb up across generations. We might erode the American dream as we have more inequality, at least something to potentially be concerned about, think about more carefully. So these are two factors that to some extent have received quite a bit of attention in the economics literature. Uh, what I'm gonna to turn to next are factors that come more from some sense other fields. So education first. Um, so school quality, uh, as you might expect intuitively, and you see this clearly in the data, places uh, where you have better schools. It's kind of hard to measure the quality of schools precisely. We're gonna talk about that later in the education segment of the class. But if you use rough proxies, like expenditures per student, class size, test scores, uh, you tend to see that places that have better schools measured in various ways tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So I think that, that makes sense intuitively. It's, it's worn out in the data. The, the fourth and fifth factors I think of as coming more from sociology than, than economics. Turns out that the single strongest correlation in the data is that areas with more single parents have significantly lower rates of upward mobility. That's an incredibly strong pattern in the data. So the, the fraction of two-parent families in an area is very strongly predictive of rates of upward mobility. Now, in understanding what is going on here, the simple thing you might think of is growing up in a two-parent family might be beneficial for kids relative to growing up in a single-parent family. And there is some of that that you see in the data. But that is not the central thing that, that's going on. And the way that you can see that is even if you look at the kids whose own parents are married, so suppose I subset the data only to children who are growing up in two-parent households. Even among those kids, if you grow up in a community with a lot of single parents, you are less likely to climb up, okay? So what that shows you is it's not literally about whether your own parents are married or not. What is predictive is the rate of single parent uh, uh, you know, households in the broader community beyond your own family. And that I think is important. So this finding, as you can imagine, gets picked up a lot in the media and people use it in various ways to argue that uh, marriage and family structure is important. And you know, that, that might be the case to some extent, but it's not literally about marriage at the individual level. It's again, picking up some community level factor. What exactly is driving it? We don't quite know yet, but there's a tight link in the data. The fifth factor is social capital. So social capital is a bit of a nebulous and complicated concept. The way I think about it is the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. So you know, will someone else help you out even if you're not doing well? The classic kind of canonical example of a place with a lot of social capital that people talk about is Salt Lake City with the Mormon church. The, the idea that you know, it's a place where others will help you out even if, if you fall on hard times. Now this concept of social capital was popularized by our colleague here at Harvard, Bob Putnam, a uh, sociologist, in a very famous book called Bowling Alone. And the reason for the title of that book, Bowling Alone, is that social capital is a notoriously hard thing to measure systematically. So Bob used the number of bowling alleys, and in particular, whether people were bowling with other friends, as a proxy for social capital, okay? So the reason I mentioned that here is, first of all, I was amazed to find that in our own data, the number of bowling alleys is in fact a very strong predictor of differences in upward mobility across places. But this, the, the reason I say that here is it also illustrates well a key caveat to everything on this slide, which is that these are correlations rather than causal effects, right? So I'd be very surprised if the way to improve upward mobility in America is to build more bowling alleys. Uh, just because we see that correlation. So that shows you that everything that you see on this slide, you have to interpret cautiously. It's not like this gives you the recipe for how you increase upward mobility, right? It just gives you clues about what might be going on. What the actual policy interventions are that are needed to improve outcomes in areas where we see lower levels of upward mobility is not yet totally obvious just from what I'm showing you here. I'll show you further stuff that lets us get deeper but for now, you have to interpret this as just correlational, gives you a sense of what to focus on, doesn't necessarily show you the causal mechanisms. Okay, so that gives you some sense of what's different about the places with high versus low levels of upward mobility. Let me stop there for a minute to see if there are questions before moving on to the next step. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's another thing that makes this quite hard, right? All of these things are correlated with each other. The places that are more segregated tend to have worse schools, maybe have more inequality, might have less, you know, larger share of single parent families. So one way you can try to get at that is kind of put them all in the model and ask which has the most predictive power in a multivariable regression. I don't like that approach because, you know, it, it, what you're gonna get from that is partly gonna depend on how well you can measure each of these things. So let me give you an example. It tends to be much easier to measure, say, the fraction of two-parent families in an area than the quality of schools. It's just hard to measure the quality of schools well because you've got to, in a sense, you know, codify the quality of instruction, what are the teachers doing, things like that. Whereas the share of single-parent families in the census, you can like literally read that off, right? And so what can happen when you do that kind of horse race analysis is you see in the data, oh, it looks like single parent shares are much more predictive than my rough measure of school quality. But what you really should conclude from that is I have a bad measure of school quality relative to single parent shares. So that's why I don't, I don't like that approach. I think you need to go deeper into each of these things to understand the mechanism, which I'll talk about you know, how we're doing that in our, in our ongoing work uh, in order to answer your question well. Others? Okay, so now what I wanna do is take the next step. I'm kind of trying to walk you through the evolution of how we start from an academic research base, start to understand what's going on in these data, and now bring it closer to policy. How are we actually engaging with the broader public to, um, and, and local policymakers to try to address these issues? So to give you a bit of a sense of how this works and how we all in our research group at Harvard uh, got into this, is that all of this research, recent research, which I've been talking uh, to you about in, in, these, in these two lectures, has, you know, one of the nice things about it is that we've really seen that it's shifted the national conversation on poverty, which of course people have been talking about the you know, war on poverty for the past 50 years. Traditionally, a lot of that is focused on things like taxation and redistribution and inequality and it's less focused on mobility out of poverty, mobility across generations, which is what I've been focused on here. Okay, and so as a result of putting out these studies in the past four or five years, we've seen a real shift in the national conversation to focus on income mobility and the role of childhood environment. So just to give you, you know, a flavor for that, a lot of this, as you can imagine, works through the media. So you will recognize this chart here um, when we put this paper out, I think that was, that was in 2015, front page of the New York Times, they, you know, they had this depiction. At that point, we didn't have the data to go far enough back to age two. That's why this only goes back to age nine, but you know, it's that same shape that we've been talking about. They talk about all that work. Uh, then you know, more recently, this article in the New York Times showing how neighborhoods shape children's, uh, children for life. Some places lift children out of poverty. Others trap them there. Now cities are trying to do something about the difference. And you know, just a series of things like that, uh, the work on racism and, sorry, racial disparities that we will talk about later. Um, you know, related work on inequality in the American dream, where you're born has a huge impact, so forth and so on. Some work on health that we will talk about later. So that generated a lot of attention. All of these studies, you know, focused on these issues. And most concretely, and uh, for me, you know, most importantly, a lot of local areas started to focus on these issues in a, in a very systematic way. So I'm gonna focus on Charlotte in particular. So Charlotte, as you'll remember from the chart that I put up earlier, is a unique city in that it ranks lowest, 50th out of 50, in terms of rates of upward mobility for kids born into low, in, low income families, despite by all traditional measures, being a very successful economy. And so people in Charlotte, when we put out this data and they saw that they were ranked 50th, got very agitated, but also motivated by this. So they say, you know, in this article on, on, in their newspaper, how on the one hand can we be such a vital and opportunity rich community, and on the other be ranked dead last in the odds that our lowest income children and youth will be able to move up the economic ladder uh, as they become adults. And so motivated by that, Charlotte formed a task force and a commission to basically focus with all of its government agencies, local philanthropies and so forth to make increasing upward mobility for kids growing up in Charlotte a central priority for the city. And so most recently, when we put out the Opportunity Atlas, and this is showing you the local area data within Charlotte, we have now started to team up our research group at Harvard with 
uh, the Charlotte local government and local actors to try to address this problem. And so the release of the Opportunity Atlas, the within Charlotte data, was really critical for doing this because it kind of changes the scale of the problem, right? Before we were telling the mayor of Charlotte and people in Charlotte, hey, you guys have really low levels of upward mobility. Look at a place like Salt Lake City, you know, you see much better outcomes there. So that's like fine, it's kind of motivating, but what are you gonna do about that? You know, Salt Lake City is completely different from Charlotte. You know, what exactly, what action are you gonna take? I think it was not totally obvious what to do. When you bring it down to this scale, and people can see you're not talking about Charlotte versus San Francisco or Boston or some totally different place. You're actually talking about one part of Charlotte versus another part of Charlotte, which looks as good as any place in the country in terms of, of kids' outcomes. That collapses the scale of the problem and makes people very motivated to try to do something about it. And so you can see this you know, more recent article. Uh, th these folks are, are, are uh, you know, acting on this where they say it's, Hard to imagine a bigger gulf than the one between um, academic researchers crunching data at Harvard and families trapped by poverty and hopeless, hopelessness in Charlotte. The two came together in the public imagination four years ago uh, when professors labeled Charlotte the worst of the country's 50 biggest uh, areas in terms of upward mobility. And now the research team that's shamed Charlotte into action is signed on to work with the city's public and private officials to see if we can do something about this. So what I'm gonna talk about uh, in the rest of this lecture and the next lecture is using Charlotte as a specific example, just more broadly around the country, how this data is being used and these sorts of big data approaches are being used uh, to tackle these questions, okay? So to do that, uh, it's useful again to divide things into two different approaches that you might think about. So when I show you these maps, conceptually there are really two different ways that you can go. Uh, in order to try to improve outcomes. The first is a moving to opportunity approach. So the idea here is if I've shown you that there are some places where kids do better, when we have like clear proof of that now from the data, what's the simplest thing that you can do to help uh, low-income kids do better? You can provide them better access to those neighborhoods. You can help them literally move to opportunity, right? Provide affordable housing in high opportunity areas in the blue colored parts of the map. So that is one very concrete approach. We'll talk about whether it works, how you can do it, what's the cost effectiveness of it, and so forth. A different approach is place-based investment. That is, take the places that are in the red colors of the map and turn them blue. Now, ultimately, if you think about it, there's no way you'll ever be able to achieve full scale purely through the moving to opportunity approach, right? You can't just move everybody out of one part of a city to a different part or from one city to another. It's just never, you're never gonna have the resources to do that. And moreover, if you try to do that on scale, you might actually change the character of the places to which you're moving people. So ultimately, you know, really the long run path is you've gotta figure out how to improve places that don't look so good right now. Now that is an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, there are some promising efforts, which I'm gonna talk about, you know, what we might learn from that, how we're addressing these issues. Actually, just yesterday, uh, I was in New York, in the Harlem Children's Zone with Jeff Canada. Some of you might know about the Harlem Children's Zone. It's an you know, extremely impressive effort to improve Harlem exactly along these lines using the sort of place-based approach. So we will come back uh, to talk about those approaches in more detail as well, okay? So I'm gonna start with the moving to opportunity uh, approach. And this section, the next set of stuff that I'm gonna talk about is gonna be based on this paper with Nathan Hendren and Larry Katz, also in the econ department here at Harvard. Um, analyzing what's called the moving to opportunity experiment that's on your syllabus, okay? So as a bit of backdrop, this moving to opportunity approach, it's not just like something we cooked up out of thin air, it's actually something we spend a ton of money on already in the United States, okay? So we spend a tremendous amount of money in the US on affordable housing policies to help low-income families move to better neighborhoods, okay? Uh, so what do these policies look like? Uh, they include subsidized housing vouchers to rent better apartments. So we spend about $20 billion a year on what are called housing choice vouchers that give families, think of it as roughly something like $10,000 a year uh, to rent apartments wherever they want. Low-income families, you've got to qualify for this. There are about 2.1 million families per year that receive these vouchers from the government. 
There are also many efforts to create mixed income affordable housing developments. So a prominent example of that is what's called the low income housing tax credit. We spend about six billion a year on that in the federal government, which gives developers tax credits for developing affordable housing, especially in higher poverty areas. And then more broadly, you can think about things like zoning regulations and building restrictions. There's a lot of talk recently about why lots of cities are zoned only for single family residences that basically keeps lower income people out of certain areas. You know, what effect is that having and so forth? So there's a lot of stuff in the kind of housing space, either implicitly or explicitly, that's kind of controlling access to opportunity. So the question I want to address in this next segment of the class is, are these types of housing policies effective in increasing social mobility? Does this moving to opportunity sort of approach work? How can we make it better, et cetera? Now, when you tackle any question like that, from an economic point of view, a very useful benchmark to start from is to think about the simplest alternative you, you, you think about to, to address any problem, which is to just to give people cash. Okay, so instead of giving people a $10,000 a year housing voucher, you could perfectly well also just give them $10,000 of cash and say, you know, do whatever you want with it, whatever you think uh, will help your kids, right? And so there's an important question, given that that is a totally feasible alternative. The US government could do that tomorrow if there was political will to do that. Do we actually want to be doing this housing, moving to opportunity type of stuff? Or do we just want to be giving people cash? OK, so I want to first see, because this is not a totally obvious thing. Greg, can we bring this up? Do you have this up? I want to do a poll and see uh, what people think the right answer is. Do we want to give people cash, or do we want to um, uh, give them housing vouchers. And we'll pull that up in one sec. Let me see. So the, the URL is the pollev.com slash act1152. Same as last time, right? Really got to have a secure polling system here. Make sure you. <laughs> All right. So, which policy will have a greater impact um, on kids' rates of upward mobility? Giving you $1,000 of cash or a $1,000 voucher to move to a higher opportunity neighborhood? Wow. All right. Looks like there's pretty strong view, although some disagreement, but pretty strong view that the moving to opportunity approach is better than, than giving people cash. OK, so that actually is a surprising, um, surprising leaning uh, for the following reasons. So let me. Uh, you know, making a slight recovery here. What's going on? <laughs> uh, OK. If I, if I wait too long on this slide, it's going to flip the other way. So I'm going <laughs> so I'm to I'm gonna move on here, all right? Um, wow. OK, I interpret that as you're not quite sure which way then what the right answer is, which is, uh, OK. So. What's the conventional economics answer? So if you think about it from a traditional economic point of view, you actually wouldn't need any data. If you take like Act 10, introductory economics, what would you kind of learn there for this sort of problem? 
economic theory would predict that cash grants of an equivalent dollar amount are strictly better than giving somebody a voucher specifically focused on housing. And what is the reason for that? It's a very simple logic. If you could do something good with a $10,000 voucher, surely you could have done exactly the same thing if I gave you $10,000 of cash, right? There's nothing you can't do with uh, the voucher that you couldn't have done with cash to begin with. So how could it possibly be the case that giving you something more restricted is actually better? Now, despite that, as I will show you, I think the majority of you are actually right that the voucher works out to be better, or at least more effective in this context, than giving people cash. That violates the standard economic model and shows you why looking at, at data is actually quite important. Okay, so um, in practice, you know, despite this prediction of standard economic theory and consistent with, I think, some of uh, in public housing, all right? So what we want to talk about is whether these policies are effective and how they can be better designed to improve social mobility. We're going to study this question specifically by focusing on the role of housing vouchers for low-income families in the context of something called the moving to opportunity experiment, okay? So uh, what we want to understand here is what is the impact of giving a family a housing voucher, the $10,000 of assistance to rent an apartment or a house, um, on kids' rates of upward mobility, that is kids' earnings in adulthood. So what I'm gonna do here is set this up precisely in a way to show you basic experimental methodology that we're then gonna apply in the context of the moving to opportunity experiment to answer this question, okay? So it's useful to, to make this clear, to introduce some mathematical notation that's very simple, but that will, will make the ideas here precise. So I'm gonna call child I's earnings uh, you know, you have a thousand different children, number them I equals one to say a thousand. We're gonna call child I's earnings Y sub I, and we're gonna define Y I if V equals one as your earnings if your family gets a housing voucher. And Y I when V equals zero is how much the child earns if the family does not get a voucher. So those are just two different numbers, right? It's two different hypothetical numbers. If your family had gotten a voucher, if your family didn't get a voucher, maybe you made $15,000 a year in one case, maybe you made $20,000 a year in the other case. What is our goal? This is what's called the S demand, or what is the objective of the empirical analysis? The objective is to estimate yi when v equals one minus yi when v equals zero. That is the causal effect of getting the voucher on kids' earnings. So I'm gonna call that G, okay? My goal is to estimate that G. Now what's the fundamental problem in empirical science? Not just social science, but any empirical science. The, the fundamental problem is that you don't observe YI when V equals one and YI when V equals zero for the same person. Or more generally, you don't observe both potential outcomes for the same unit that you're interested in. So in other words, uh, for any given child in, in the world, either their family got the housing voucher or they didn't, right? You can't have it both ways. So you can only see one of these two things. And so at some deep level, there's a missing data problem here. You cannot conceptually see the information both in the state of the world where we didn't do the thing and the state of the world where we did do the thing, right? So this is not just true in economics, it's obviously true in any scientific context, right? I give you the pill, I don't give you the pill. Either you took the drug or you didn't, all right? And so how can you solve this problem? This is kind of the, the basic focus of research on causality in statistics. There's a whole field of causal inference exactly because we can't see both outcomes uh, for, you know, in, in a given case. And so going back a uh, hundred years, the gold standard solution that people have come up with in order to solve that problem is to run a randomized experiment, right? It goes back to basic lab science, um, what people now like to call, uh, for reasons I'm not totally clear about, A-B testing uh, in the lingo of tech firms, basically running a randomized experiment. Um, and so, you know, what, what's the way to do that in our context with the housing voucher here? 
Let's say you take 10,000 kids, you flip a coin, and determine if each of them gets a voucher or not, okay? And then what you do is compute the average level of earnings for the 5,000 who randomly got a voucher and the 5,000 who, who randomly did not get a voucher. And the difference between those two averages gives you an estimate of G, the average treatment effect of getting that voucher. So what's the intuition for why the randomized experiment works? Basically, it ensures that the two groups are identical, except for the fact that one of them got the vouchers and one of them didn't. So the fundamental idea is that even though I can't see the same kid in both different situations, if you average over enough people, you know, and randomly do this many, many times, the characteristics of the people, the 5,000 people who happen to get the voucher, they're going to be pretty similar to the 5,000 people who didn't get the voucher, right? That's the basic logic, especially as the sample gets large. They're going to have similar racial backgrounds, similar, you know, educations, everything else is going to be similar about them. So you can really isolate just the causal effect of getting the voucher itself, all right? So <clears throat> it, why is randomization really the core thing there that allows you to identify the causal effect of getting the voucher. Suppose you instead did something that would actually be much simpler. Rather than running this randomized experiment, suppose you just compared 10,000 people, you took 10,000 people, half of them applied for the voucher and half of them didn't. So you have to apply for housing vouchers in the United States. Some people don't, some people do. You know, much easier than running an experiment. Suppose you just compared the data for those two groups of people, right? Uh, you could perfectly well compare the average earnings of people who applied versus people who didn't. Now, why doesn't that work? Why is that problematic? The, the, the core problem is that there's no guarantee that any difference in earnings that you see between those two groups is driven by getting the voucher itself. It could be driven by any number of other differences in those two groups. So let's take a couple examples. The people who choose to apply for vouchers they kind of have their act together, they might be more educated, they might be more on top of things, maybe that's why they earn more to begin with. That's gonna create a bias in that comparison. Or, going in the other direction, maybe the people who apply for housing vouchers are people who are particularly desperate to get out of the places where they're currently living, and they have particularly negative outcomes as a result. It could go the other way as well, right? And that would bias you to finding that the vouchers don't have an effect. So when you're just comparing two groups, one of which did something and one of which didn't, and you don't randomize, you can't be sure that the differences you're seeing are due to the causal effect of the thing you're trying to change. Randomization basically ensures balance. It ensures comparability across the groups and eliminates all of these differences. Okay, now a common practical problem that we face in randomized experiment uh, when we try to do this in the field is what's called non-compliance. So in medical trials, this is the easiest way to see this, you often will uh, randomize people to taking, say, a new drug for diabetes that another group did not, uh, got the placebo. But you won't necessarily have perfect adherence. So you would like people to take the pill every single day. But in practice, some people forget, or they choose not to, or something else happens, and the, they decide not to take it. Uh, and so that's what we call non-compliance. They don't do what they don't comply with what the experimenter had intended. Similarly, in the voucher case, how does that happen? I randomly give, let's say, half of the people in this auditorium a voucher and the others don't get it. The people who get the voucher, there's no guarantee that all of them are gonna use it to rent a new apartment, right? Many people might look, they might say, oh, I have this voucher, but I, you know, I can't find something that I really like, I don't wanna move in the end, so they end up not moving to a different place. So, that's an important practical problem because you can't force people to comply with the treatments, right? You can't make people move to a different place. You can't make them take the pill. You can only offer them a treatment and then you've got to let them do whatever they want to do. So, you know, you might think, okay, that seems like a serious problem. How can I actually learn from an experiment if I have non-compliance? Turns out though that you can fix that pretty easily. Uh, using a technique uh, that's been developed by statisticians, including people like Josh Angrist, who's a professor at MIT, uh, where um, basically you just adjust the estimated impact for the rate of compliance. So let me give you an example. 
Suppose half the people to whom I offered a voucher actually use it to rent an apartment, all right? So I give 500 people a voucher, only 250 of them actually use it to rent an apartment. Now suppose I go to the data and I see that the raw difference in earnings between those who were offered a voucher and those who were not offered a voucher is $1,000, okay? Then I can conclude that the effect of using the voucher to rent a new apartment must have been $2,000 on average earnings. Because for the people who didn't use the voucher to move to a different place, you know, by assumption in this context, there's no effect. They sort of didn't use the pill anyway. They didn't use the treatment. And so the $1,000 impact that we're seeing, the $1,000 gain, must be driven by the half of the people who actually use the voucher to move to, move to a new place, right? So if I see a $1,000 effect on average, and only half the people used it, I kind of do $1,000 divided by 0.5 to get to 2,000 as the implied impact of the experiment for the people who complied with the treatment. Okay, so more generally, if only 10% of the people complied, I would divide 1,000 by 0.1, and figure out that that actual impact for the 10% who complied was $10,000. So you can see, you know, true impact is estimated impact divided by compliance rate is gonna be a general way to fix this problem. And this works, you know, without very strong assumptions that's something that's been shown uh, in the literature. So do, is that concept clear? Excellent question. So that's actually an important issue. So this is basically giving you the effect, for, the implied effect for the compliers. A separate question is what would the effect have been for the people who chose not to comply? Could well be very different, right? So in particular, suppose the people who knew that moving to a better place would be really beneficial for them are the ones who comply. Then you're gonna get a valid estimate of the treatment effect for those compliers, but it may not apply to the non-compliers. And so there's a whole literature on that in econometrics about how what's called a local average treatment effect applies to a certain set of compliers. It may not apply to non-compliers. So that's a limitation of what we're gonna do here. I would argue from a policy perspective, I care about the treatment effect for the compliers typically, right? When I'm giving out housing vouchers, I don't really care what happens to the people who don't take the housing vouchers anyway because I'm not spending money on them. I care about the impact for the compliers. So it's kind of okay for that purpose. Good question. Others? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, the, the first thing you might think of is why do you bother with all this? Let's just ignore the people who didn't comply and only compare the compliers to, to everyone else. So that makes sense intuitively. The problem with that is that who chooses to comply is itself not random, okay? So suppose the people who comply are only the, you know, the more sophisticated people or people who are more informed or something like that. Now when you compare them to the average person in the control group, you've now destroyed the experimental balance. So that's why this is a clever way to get around that problem. You retain the comparability, but you adjust for the compliance rate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna talk about that. So that's more of like an economic concern than a statistical concern, right? Like how generalizable are these estimates basically as you make these experiments? But you're, I'll come back to that in more detail. Of course, there's no guarantee when you do any one experiment that if you did it on a larger scale, you'll find similar effects, absolutely. Um, okay, so we're essentially out of, uh, out of time. Let me just quickly preview where we're headed. So what we're gonna do is apply this methodology of you know, experimental design adjusting for differences in compliance rates to the moving to opportunity experiment where it was an amazing case where the government actually literally ran a randomized experiment, gave 5,000 families housing vouchers to move to different neighborhoods. We're gonna see what effects that had and then talk about how we're applying that to improve housing voucher policy around the US. Right.